will start with on MCQ. All of you can see. So, what, what will be your choice? When there is burst abdomen, mass closure of abdomen should be done with huge curve needle, nylon with buttons, okay? tight and strong suture, double loop PDS. Abdomen should be closed with number one proline, tension suture with batteries and gauze should be applied. Any answer? Sir, what is your choice? No, oh, speak up. D. Okay. D. I think I think you will find an answer D after this presentation. Okay. So I think you all know about intraabdominal activation and abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, ex actually, this is the least focused chapter in surgery, and we also were not aware. Till almost 2008, 2009, then only we try to focus on this. There are very little presentations on abdominal compartment syndrome. There are very less classes. If you go on surgery book, then previously it was only a paragraph of abdominal compartment syndrome. Now, now slowly there are chapters on abdominal compartment syndrome. So have you? Uh, this is any call when you are on call, like some patient with there is a some there is a patient with abdominal compartment syndrome and you have been called. So, is there any such situation? Was there anyone called for abdominal compartment syndrome in your ward? Okay, there is one hand raised, two. Yeah, Dr. Pickle must have been <laughs> called upon, but. Like from medicine or from guidance department or other departments, are there any call for abdominal compartment syndrome? No, I don't think so. So, so it, it is least focused chapter. So actually, abdominal compartment syndrome is uh, sustained intra-abdominal uh, pressure when it is raised to 20 with with organ failure, multiple organ failure. So see with organ failure and what we are focusing is on organ failure not the intra-abdominal hypertension so so this diagnosis when you make diagnosis it is already a, already a late diagnosis okay so you have to be very cautious that if we diagnose it early during intra-abdominal hypertension before it is more than 20 then only then only we can save the patient, we can save the patient from complications and comorbidities. So, with abdominal compartment syndrome, there are almost all organs are uh, affected by the syndrome. Okay? Uh, most of the patients, they have stagnia, we, we say it respiratory failure, they have anuria, we say renal failure, okay? respiratory failure, cardiac failure, and we just focus on those things. And we don't focus on abdominal compartment syndrome, and we don't focus on the preventive measures uh, that actually was needed for, for the patient. So, usually what happens is, after this intra-abdominal pressure is increased, the patient will go to a vicious cycle. Okay? So, there will be increased abdominal pressure, the patient go into multi-organ failure, and again that also again will increase abdominal pressure, and there will be a vicious cycle. And it will be very difficult to control once the patient is already in organ failure. So you all know about the grading of uh, abdominal intra-abdominal hypertension. I think you know the this gradient, okay, how to grade. Uh, usually, intraabdominal abdominal hypertension, it is counted if it is above 12, but actually from 8, okay, if it is above 8, then there is already start of hypoperfusion of the abdominal organs, 
there is already ischemia, some level of ischemia, and if that is prolonged, and if it is more than 12, then there will be certain complications will start, and the patient slowly goes to abdominal compartment syndrome and body organ uh, failure. Okay? And you see, if it is more than 20 with multi organ failure, that is already compartment syndrome. And uh, you see the mortality, okay, it will be almost, it was 100% when there was abdominal compartment syndrome. And it will be lethal even despite eventual de decompression of the, uh, decompression and correction of the abdominal pressure. So, so it is very important to diagnose it early. <coughs> have you measured, how many of you have measured interabdominal pressure? Can you raise your hand? One, two. So, so not much, very few I think. It's, it's a surgical resident forum and <coughs> I think we should have been measuring the intraabdominal pressure regularly, but but we are not doing that because we are unaware of the, uh, this very lethal fatal syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome. Okay, and I'm sure, like for medical residents and gynecological residents or other departments, no one will be measuring this <coughs> intraabdominal pressure. So, how we can measure, uh, I think you, you know that, during laparoscope we are measuring uh, interabdominal pressure, that is the direct peritoneal uh, cannulation that we can do, okay. Other indirect methods are like transrectal, transgastric, or even through IVC, transversal. But more popular, more easy one will be transversal. And all of you are doing that, I know, uh, through transfer cycle, this measurement of the abdominal pressure. And do you know this zero reference? Where do you put this zero? Any answer? Pubic symbiosis. Excellent. Yes. That also I was teaching you. Many of my residents I was teaching and they, they, they were doing it on that. This symphysis previous. But now, no, now the guideline has changed. Okay? Now you will be measuring in the mid axillary line. Okay? Mid axillary line, naturally, that will be the zero reference. And all the pressures should be measured in uh, millimeter of mercury. Previously, we were using centimeter of water and then changing to millimeter of mercury. Now, now it should be measured in millimeter of mercury or you change during the measurement and the zero reference should be in the mid axillary line. <coughs> so, interabdominal pressure okay, uh, is, is the steady state pressure concealed within the abdomen. That is why it is concealed. That is why we don't give attention. Okay? And it is measured via the bladder. And how much to put water in this saline or water inside the bladder, we usually used to put like 100 ml, 150 ml, but actually now the guideline is gone and it's 25 ml that you put in the bladder and then measure uh, intravesical, this uh, transvesical abdominal pressure. And it should be expressed in millimeter of mercury and in the in expiratory phase. In These guidelines I uh, it was previously uh, this consensus was made in 2004 and the guideline was made and that was revised in 2006 and it was updated on 2013. Okay. Uh, still there are so many unanswered and unexplained questions that we have in this abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, usually, interabdominal pressure should be 5 to 7. In physically, patients, if it is raised, that should be raised interabdominal pressure. But on definition, it's if it is raised above 12, that is interabdominal hypertension. And if it is with multi organ failure, then that is 
known as abdominal compartment syndrome. Okay? You all know this grading, grade 1, 2, 3, 4. If it is more than 25, then, then it is really alarming. The patient will go to multi organ uh, failure. <coughs> And it is also classified as primary, secondary, and recurrent. Okay? You all know about primary. If abdominal organ is involved, if the abdominal compartment syndrome is due to abdominal organ, that is primary. And most of them are diagnosed because they come to surgeons, and surgeons are a little bit aware of abdominal compartment syndrome. But the secondary intra-abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome they are very less diagnosed because they usually occur in ICUs, CCUs, medical wards and uh, who are not that aware of abdominal compartment syndrome. Okay? And a recurrent means the condition in which interabdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome redevelops following previous surgical or medical treatment. And there is a new term called abdominal perfusion pressure. Abdominal perf perfusion pressure, just like cerebral perfusion pressure, is being used. Uh, it's uh, like mean arterial pressure minus uh, intra-abdominal pressure. That will be abdominal perfusion pressure. <coughs> and in trauma patients, there may be polycompartment syndrome. Okay? Multiple compartments are involved. And we have to know about abdominal compliance. What is abdominal compliance? Okay. The change in intra-abdominal volume or change in intra-abdominal pressure. And the definition of open abdomen, okay, that, that requires a temporary abdominal closure due to the skin and fascia <coughs> and not being closed after laboratory. Uh, usually during laboratory when you are in closer, okay. anesthesia, they have they have dinner, they have party, and they will just push you to close the abdomen as early as possible. And usually, who will close the abdomen? The junior most who is there, no, he is never tired, and seniors has already come. So you just try okay, to switch up, just like uh, in whatever way, you have to close it. And you find it difficult, it may tear, then the senior will blame you. Oh, you don't know how to suture it. You are tearing the fascia. So actually, maybe at that time, it was already in charge of hypertension, and it would be wise not to close the abdomen in that case. So that is why Bogota back came into use. No? You all know the history. It was the intern, surgical intern, who actually started this urinary bag to use as Bogota bag because it was very difficult to close the abdomen, and it was not knowingly that abdominal compartment syndrome would develop, not to prevent that, but it was to close the abdomen. But later, when retrospective study was done, they found okay. The patient without closing abdomen, they had better prognosis, they had less complications, they had less these multi organ failures than the one who were closed tightly. Previously, we used to have this very big needle, curved big needle with nylon, strong nylon, nylon specially designed for tensile switches. Have you seen? How many of you have seen these tensile switches? For this mass closure, still I think that there, there are many uh, surgeon, these OT stores who have this huge needle with large nylons, thinking that it will be easier to close. Okay? But but now, from now, from today, all residents should stop closing the abdomen with tensile suture. Okay, you should leave it open with Bogota bag or other processes that are available, but you shouldn't try closing forcefully. And there is a term called lateralization of the abdomen wall when you when there is tension, when you leave it open slowly the rectus sheath and skin subcutaneous tissue will move laterally and that will make 
more difficult to close that one. So you see risk factors, there are so many layers. Okay? See? Three or four. So there are so many risk factors for development of abdominal compartment syndrome. Not only related to surgery, not surgical. So I am not going to read all these risk factors. And there are certain terms like no fixation, that means whether the after leaving the abdomen open, whether there is uh, these interactive organs that are fixed to the walls, peritoneal walls, if they are fixed, it will be difficult to close in the subsequent uh, days. Okay? Uh, no fixation, developing fixation or frozen abdomen, that means there is already the organs are frozen with the wall and there is erosion and there is also chance of interior atmospheric fistula. Because you have left the abdomen open, there will be interior atmospheric fistula and there will be frozen. So it is also classified like 1, 2, 3, 4. So this picture is not very really clear, I think. Uh, so when there is abdomen compartment syndrome, you know, you don't know what to do. Surgeon to come, physician to come, or others. So, there are certain rec recommendations. Okay? We must measure interabdominal pressure in, in almost all patients who are at risk of developing interabdominal hypertension. So, how frequently should you measure? How frequently? Any idea? So, so the guideline says it should be at least four hours. Okay? Every four hours you should measure interabdominal pressure and trans bladder technique is uh, uh, more commonly used and more easy and cheap okay uh, and there should be protocolized monitoring and management of interabdominal pressure i don't think we any of us have this protocol but we are trying to measure this interabdominal pressure more frequently uh, and there should be efforts protocols to avoid sustained uh, interabdominal hypertension so, so this recommendation you can see uh, this is in the website of uh, World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. Okay, this is 2013 consensus, and you all can find in internet. Uh, and about this decompression laminotomy, we are never called for decompression. Okay, so you have to, uh, if your patient, then you have to decide when to go for decompression laboratory, when to open the abdomen. Uh, don't be too late, otherwise we will be losing the patient, okay? Uh, so, conscious and propolized efforts will be made uh, to obtain an early or at least same hospital stay. When you have kept the abdomen open, what we are using is transfusion bag. We are using transfusion bag to lay it open and you should close the abdomen before the patient is discharged in the same hospital setting. And there is also a negative pressure wound therapy, which has been found to be useful. Uh, there are certain suggestions that to uh, reduce this interactive hypertension, okay, pain and anxiety relief should be there. Uh, this neuromuscular blockage should be given to relax the abdomen and about the position some of the patients because of the ventilation they are kept in prone position so that also will increase the uh, abdominal pressure so we have to be very careful is there anything external things that are that is compressing the patient's abdomen and we should be using liberal use of internal decompression with nasogastric or rectal tubes and neostigmine can be used for treatment of established colonic ileus, not responding to other simple measures. Uh, and especially in way, when we are giving fluid to the for acute resuscitation, like for trauma cases and acute pancreatitis, those cases also can may uh, develop abdominal compartment syndrome, and we should be very careful for that. Uh, 
and in a ratio of plasma packed red blood cells for resuscitation of massive tumors with the air. And this percutaneous drainage instead of uh, decompression plasmatomy sometimes will be useful. And these things I think you can find it in internet. Most of the things are already covered. Okay, there are certain questions. So, but my conclusion will be that we must be aware of this abnormal compartment syndrome and we must do all measures to prevent abnormal compartment syndrome and if it happens then this management should be done as early as possible. Thank you.